Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the first in a series of our Dairy B500 webinars. On tonight's show, we're going to be discussing calf health and calf housing. We're coming into what's going to be a very busy time of the year where farmers are getting ready to buy and rear calves from dairy farms. The key priorities of a successful calf rearing period is to ensure that calf housing and calf health are adequate for optimum performance. Our excellent panel tonight will share advice and experience to ensure a very successful calf rearing season. Joining me in the studio are Martin Cavanagh from Munster Bovine, Peter O'Hanoran, a programme farmer from County Kilkenny, and also Sarah Higgins from MSD Animal Health. My name is Alan Dillon, Dairy B500 Programme Manager, and I'd like to remind you this evening that this webinar has been recorded. So we're going to encourage your participation tonight to ask questions, and uh, we'd ask that you please use the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. So first up tonight to give us a very interesting presentation on calf housing is Martin Kavanagh, a uh, vet with, MS, with Munster Bovine, and I'd like to hand it over to you now, Martin. Thanks, thanks Alan, very much, and good evening, everybody. Um, uh, I, my name is Martin Kavanagh. I'm a vet. I've been working in dairy and beef production for the last 30 years, um, and I work now for Munster Bovine. Uh, I'm, I'm going to just cover one main topic: is really looking at um, uh, calf housing. It's a piece that interests everybody. Everybody is is conscious of this. Uh, what is the ideal calf house? So, and really, what we're driving at here is: are we getting enough um, air? Uh, in, in, a, in a way that's healthy into this group of calves because remembering about a third of our calf uh, deaths between one and five months of, uh, of age are resulting from uh, pneumonia. Sarah will go into that in a bit more detail in terms, in terms of its production effect but one thing we've got to really think about any disease that interferes with that calf in that first certainly that first 12 weeks of life has a lifetime knock-on effect uh, particularly when it affects their overall dry matter intake. So our goal here is really preventing sickness, not necessarily uh, just death alone or, or those acute cases. Um, and the one thing I want to make really, really clear here is the building the perfect calf house, or I'm often asked for the perfect plan, is, is, is not straightforward. Every site is different, every farm is different, and every requirement is different. And I can't pull off uh, the, the perfection for that. What, what I find in Ireland a lot of the time is that uh, we do a lot of house conversion and that can work very successfully for you if you follow a couple of very uh, basic principles. So we'll follow through with some of those principles. Um, the one thing I see in Ireland quite a bit because of our main rearing period in, in, in that early springtime, a lot of our sheds are really cold. Uh, they're freezers and they're thermal sinks. They're open, uh, a lot of concrete, a lot of steel. And generally, when we're trying to ventilate them, we, all we can move is the door. So they're fixed objects of the wind whistling around them. Uh, I really like sheds not to be too wide. Um, it, once we're going over about 10 metres or 30 feet, it's getting a bit, bit more of a challenge to, to vent them. And then the orientation of that shed in the yard, if it's orientated according to the other buildings that are there, it sometimes can be an issue because it's not getting the, the prevailing wind onto the side. Uh, if our site is very exposed, uh, we can have trouble with wind chill constantly. Um, and we have to remember our calf has to lie down. It, it, it lies down a lot of the time. It needs a good proper nest to lie down in to keep it warm. And also that's where we need air change is really at the bed level. So wet and dirty beds are an enormous issue for rearing calves. So keeping that bed dry so it's not having a chilling effect and also getting the moisture away is, is, uh, is, is critical. And getting air into the building, we have to avoid calves being in a draft of any kind. Um, the principle, a lot of the time when we look at calf housing, people talk about the stack effect. So the hot air rising from the calves out the top and we get nice fresh air coming in at the sides. That's the ideal world, uh, but in my experience of dealing with calf housing in general, I find this actually happens very, very rarely. Um, and what we have in most cases is this type of scenario where we have inside that shed is quite cold due to the wet and the moisture, the concrete. And, and the time of year. Those calves aren't big enough to generate enough heat. They're not fully functional ruminants. They don't raise enough uh, uh, warm air. So therefore, we often get air falling in through, through that roof canopy, and we don't get sufficient air coming in at the side. So we get a stagnant building um, that, that, again, is there's no other moving parts in there. 
So we often need to rely on the wind, and the wind is our friend in many cases, but also can be our enemy. So we, if we have the wind hitting the prevailing side, we can get a significant cross ventilation or a cross, uh, cross wind going, uh, going through that building, which can help uh, ch give us air change and fresh air. But when we see that we can get significant downdraft if we get high air speeds coming off particularly high walls, and a lot of our walls on the side of the shed are eight foot high due to the shuttering, um, we, we get significant downdraft. If we don't protect those calves against the downdraft from the prevailing side, we will get wind chill. If that, that drops the calves' temperature significantly and their immune system isn't able to catch up. So we have a few things to balance here. An unmoving shed, no air actually getting out of it, and managing wind or the source of wind. And remember, every time we open a door or a window or a gap, we speed up the wind going through it because the gap is narrower. So if you look at here as a particular example, and I know within the video Peter talks about Yorkshire boarding and so on, Yorkshire boarding is very useful. It's about 25% a, a, about open, but it baffles the wind so we don't get a direct draft. But here in this house was really interesting. We built Yorkshire boarding here, uh, but we found we got significant draft inside the house because of the wind tunnel that's been created by the opposite building. So we get high air speeds against the Yorkshire bo boarding, and that led to draft inside. So Yorkshire boarding can be very useful, particularly on a leeward side of a building where we can't get a lot of air in, and certainly in sites that are not so exposed. So generally a five inch board with a two inch gap, and either a two to four inch gap between those boards in a staggered fashion, develops our Yorkshire boarding as such. So very useful, but be careful we don't end up with too much wind coming through. Um, sometimes we use positive pressure, so seal down the house, if we cannot control the wind in there and actually pump air into it. These systems need to be designed for the size of the house, the number of the calves, because the, the, the fan speed and the holes punched in the plastic will determine uh, how fast that air will get down onto the calves and avoid draft. So don't just buy them off the internet, get someone to design that for your building properly. Generally work quite well in buildings up to about 30 meters long. Uh, beds is a personal bugbear here. Uh, again, on, on one of the pictures, you see the calves lying in at the side of the wall, and they're a very good judge of what's going on. They will find the driest lie, and often when I used to go to farms, people would put in a lot of straw to make it look good in one way, but the calves would tell me very quickly whether that bed was dry or not. And if I'm, I know we talk about the knee drop test and coming up with a wet knee gives an indication, I'm a bit more ruthless, I'll get in there with a fork and actually dig up that bed and see how wet and how much drainage are we achieving in, inside in that bed. Remember, if that calf is lying on a cold, wet bed, it will chill down, particularly when they're under a month of age. It'll chill down much more, so getting the bed dry. So how do we do it? Uh, lots of straw, really helpful. Very difficult year for straw, straw this year, and I appreciate that, but in the young calves, we definitely need to consider the volumes of straw we need to allow a dry bed. Critical to it, really, again, is creating a good fall, and this is a converted barn where we put in a fall of 5% on the floor to get the drainage. We really need realistically to look at those type of falls, which builders really don't like, but we gotta consider it to get enough drainage and proper drains then to take that uh, liquid away. In this case, this is an open drain that we used with some pea gravel in it. It was very, very successful, and uh, we were able to keep that bed very, very dry. So consider the drainage, consider the falls, and that'll influence how you hang gates and so on. Uh, here's just a quick video. This was a con converted house, and I convert, I'm involved a lot in converting buildings. I, I'm really, do I always want to build a new calf house? No, often we can make something else work for us here. And this was again, we put vented sheeting on the back here actually, because it was a prevailing wind. Uh, there's canopies at the back to prevent the downdraft, which is very important, and just use them at, again, some, it was netting and straw to make them very simple, lots of different methods uh, to do this. In this particular shed was actually also used as a machinery shed, so it was quite open. And in this case, these are Frisian calves with jackets on up to about a month old uh, to, to cope with the lower temperature. And a nice addition, a calf kitchen to one side. I really like this and I always try and recommend these built on as an extension. So a clean area for mixing and having hot water and keeping feed and so on. So these are just little things here. Uh, the fall, the new floor was put in there as well to bring the fall out to the front uh, so that we could get very, very good uh, drainage of those beds in the back. So this is, this is a conversion, not a new shed and was done relatively cheaply. So we can make do if we follow the principles of get the moisture out, cut down the draft, make sure there's a, there is enough um, air change and we keep the temperature uh, sorted, particularly for these young calves. Remember under th two, three weeks of age, 
calves like to be at 15 to 25 degrees really suits them in terms of growth and that's very hard to achieve without a dry bed or a jacket. So look, these are just some of the pointers. Uh, don't be married to the fact I'm going to build a perfect calf shed. We can adapt and also if you build a shed and you find it difficult, there's things you can do with it with good advice. Have a chat with your vet about it or again any of the agricultural advisory uh, who have expertise in this area. The challenge for us is let's keep the antibiotics out of these calves. If I'm treating calves with antibiotics, I'm interfering with their future life in terms of growth because you will have damage done in there that you mightn't see. So we need to do the right things and we need to do them right in terms of how we manage building design. So that's a, just a little overview of things we need to think about with our calf sheds. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks Martin. Thanks very much for that. I suppose just a quick one there. You mentioned, I suppose, the bedding and, and I suppose we were seeing a lot of trouble around the country this year with straw shortages. Yeah. Um, I suppose, is there any way, ways of farmers getting around it, I suppose, given the cost of straw and maybe availability may be a big problem in places? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I was only down the west uh, recently, down in Kerry, and that, like, in st straw is very, very scarce, very, very difficult. Okay, so if, if we have a low amount of straw, let's keep it for the very youngest calves, because they're the ones we really want to manage to get them onto a dry bed and nest. If we want to reduce the amount of straw we're using, get some other soakage or drainage underneath them, and that could be wood chip. We can reduce the amount of straw used on top. We can still keep our bit of nesting, but we have something else absorbing a lot of that moisture. Look at the drainage in the shed. If you can do something about it now, that would be very useful. And in some cases, using a very simple slat, even a basic plastic or a wooden slat, can reduce the amount of straw you use. So these are things to consider. But for those young calves, try and use the straw for those, for those youngsters. Okay, and we'll be back to you again in a, in a while, Martin, but thanks very much for that presentation. Thanks, um, this is just to remind you again, I suppose, if you have any questions, just type them into that Q&A tab and I'll read them out there to, the, to our panel there towards the end. So next up is uh, one of our Dairy B500 programme farmers, Peter O'Hanron from County Kilkenny. Um, so before we come to you, Peter, for a few questions, we, we visited your farm there about 12 months ago to look at your facilities and you, a number of changes made in your farm. So we're, we're just going to have a look at your video now to start with. The farm here consists of 90 hectares, 91 hectares of grassland. Um, we run a calf to beef system um, along with my father. Um, we buy in the calves from anywhere from two to three weeks of age. They're brought through to slaughter anywhere between 22 and 28 months of age. I'm buying all the calves locally from four to five different farmers. Um, I'm going back to the same farmers each year. I know the farmers, I know they've got their colostrum, I know the herd status, um, I know the calves are well looked after and they're healthy when I'm getting them. Calves arrive here, they're given access to a fresh deep bed of clean straw, they're given access to clean fresh water, calf crunch, they're registered then with EID tags um, through the calf feeder. Calves arrive on farm they're left for 24 hours to acclimatise and get used to their surroundings. We then dose for coccidiosis and we vaccinate against bacteria and viral pneumonia. The calf shed here is um, it's a four bay shed. It's 20 foot wide, 10 foot passage, 20 foot wide. It's concrete walls, sides and back. It's all open to the front of the shed, sliding doors either side, access roller door for the centre passage. Um, we went with the sliding doors for the ease of cleaning out the shed. We slide one door across onto the other side, we let the calves into the middle passage, clean it out, let the calves back in and slide the other door across on this door and do the exact same on the other side. It makes it really easy to clean out and you clean it out a lot more often than it is easy. Um, next then we have the Yorkshire Borden is, around, is along both sides of the shed. It's leaving one span open on either side of fresh air coming through, that's what it equates to. Um, there's plenty of light in the shed, we've clear lights along the roof on both sides, we've plenty of lights, we have canopies in the middle and the top for letting out any of the stale air. Um, we have a slope 1 in 20 in the floor for drainage, two channels either side and they both slope to the front and into a tank. We also have the canopies I made up the canopies, it just creates a little micro environment for the calves. It stops any downdraft coming down along the wall to the calves. And when you come in in the mornings, you would see the calves lying under the canopies. They're very easy to, they're light, 
They're very easy to pull up and down for cleaning out the shed. Okay, Peter. Um, very interesting video there about your farm, I suppose. We visited you uh, around 12 months ago and did that video. I suppose just, could you give us a summary? Has anything changed in your farm in terms of the system since that time? And, and where's the farm going for the future, I suppose? Yeah, I suppose um, we changed to buying in some autumn calves this year, um, mostly to spread the workload, make use of the facilities, the calf shed, the calf feeder that we have. Um, it gives us different options with cash flow, different types of the year, and mostly just housing and spread the workload. Okay, um, and, and sourcing those calves, is it, is it easy to get those autumn calves? or um, Not as easy as the spring calves. This year, just trying to build up. I have two or three guys this year now and trying to build on that. Okay, okay. Thanks, Peter. We'll be back to you later again for our panel discussion. Uh, and a reminder again, <coughs> we have the Q&A tab there on the, on the bottom of the screen and just to keep those questions coming in and we'll, we'll answer as many as possible there in, in, at the end of the, the, the presentations. I suppose so next up then is our final speaker for the evening and, and this is Sarah Higgins from MSC Animal Health and Sarah will discuss calf health and keeping that calf very healthy during the rearing period which is where the problems lie I suppose for a lot of, uh, a lot of farmers so we'll leave it over to you there now Sarah, thanks. Thanks, Alan. As Alan said, I'm Sarah Higgins. I'm ruminant and equine veterinary manager with MSD Animal Health. I was a vet in practice for around 10 years in mixed practices, but predominantly cattle based. And I am now a technical vet advisor in a pharmaceutical MSD company. So today I'm just going to discuss calf health. Um, and when it comes to calf health, our overall goal or objective is to optimize the calf's immunity in conjunction with reducing infectious pressure. And how can we go about that? Well, it's really important that you implement or have a, st a strategic plan in place for control measures. And this would incorporate vaccination, good biosecurity measures, hygiene, good farm management, and also housing, which Martin has already covered in his earlier presentation. So I think to start with calf health, I think a really good place is to start at the beginning. So the where your calves are coming from, the source farms. If you can reduce the number of source farms that will be less risk. So if you have less uh, farms that the calves are coming from, you will reduce infectious pressure, you will reduce the risk of transmission of disease, and ultimately reduce the incidence of disease within your batch of calves, in particular respiratory disease and also calf scour. And in Peter's case, it was ideal that he sources from four to five local farms that he knows and trusts, and he's aware of the background of the farms. So you want to ideally know that the calves get excellent colostrum management, which would typically would involve getting three litres of good quality beastins within the first two hours of life from the first milking. You'd like to know the disease status of the herd that they're coming from. You know, is there a current uh, viral outbreak going on in the herd? Um, are the, the herds that the calves are coming from, are they using a vaccination programme? If so, what are they using and at what age are the calves uh, or the dams getting vaccinated at? And also the transportation conditions as well, that the calves are moving from A to B to the, to the new setup on your farm. So overall, if you have a higher number of sources of, uh, of source farms, you're going to have a greater risk of disease. So then when the calves arrive on farm, I guess, what are you looking out for? Well, uh, this is not just for the first 24, 48 hours. You should be monitoring your calves regularly every day. But in particular, after such a stressful uh, movement to your farm, you really need to be looking out for these signs that are listed here. So are your calves off form? Are they lying separated away from other batches of calves? Uh, have they reduced appetite? Are they reluctant to feed? Um, are they weak? Are they wobbly? Do they have a staggering gait? Um, also another thing to look out for, it's very, very common, would be ocular or nasal discharge. So is there streaming from the eyes? It can be one eye or both eyes. Often it's a watery discharge. Is there a nasal discharge? And again, that can vary from a serous, which is a watery discharge, to much more mucusy discharge. Are they coughing? Have they an increased respiration? So that would you refer to that often as have they a bit of a draw or a pant on them? Do they have a fever? So calves sh shouldn't have a temperature greater than 39.5 degrees Celsius. And are they scouring? Have they clean back ends on them? Or have they a watery scour or a yellow scour or a blood scour present? So if you see any of these signs, you need to really act promptly and investigate, see what's going on with these calves. So have a look at them. And if you're not happy what's going on, if you're not sure what sort of disease is at play here, I'd highly recommend contacting your own PVP. That's your own private veterinary practitioner so that they can diagnose the disease early and treat accordingly, which is really, really important. And I suppose the most common disease you'd see in these sort of calves will be pneumonia, scour, meningitis, and even na navel infections as well. 
So another good thing to just to discuss is the difference between subclinical and clinical. I think most farmers are well aware of what clinical disease is. So for example, that image there, you can see there's a nice batch of calves in a nice open airy shed, but you can see there's a calf there on the left hand side and he's lying with his head out, his ears are drooped, he just looks a little bit duller, duller demeanour than the rest of the calves. And that calf more than likely is clinically sick. So there's something going on there, whether it's a pneumonia or a scour. But that sick calf that you see there is only the tip of the iceberg. There is other calves in that cohort that have invisible disease, and that's what we call subclinical. So to you or I, to a vet or to a farmer, they have no of the, the clinical signs that I listed earlier present, but they do have lesions or disease going on. And there are studies out there, um, in particular focusing on respiratory disease, that the calves can have a subclinical disease can be 23 to 67 percent of a batch of calves, which is very significant. And they have uh, an impact on productivity for both the clinical and the subclinical calves in those cases. So um, Martin already uh, alluded to this earlier in his presentation, th uh, that pneumonia or respiratory disease is a very common cause of death, in particular cattle greater than one month of age in Ireland. So calves one to five months of age, wanelands and adult cattle, year in, year out, the region veterinary labs across the country diagnose respiratory infections, typically pneumonia, which is lesions in the lungs, as a cause of death in cattle. So it's very, very prevalent and very, very common cause of mortality in cattle greater than a month of age. So what is bovine respiratory disease? I think a lot of people often refer to it as pneumonia, but pneumonia really is, is the, one of the main syndromes of the umbrella term bovine respiratory disease. And pneumonia is, as I said, it's lesions right into the lung, pulmonary lesions. And it's quite a complex disease entity that culminates in variable interactions between the host, which is the animal itself, so the calf in this case, Pathogens, which is the veterinary term for bugs, so that would include viruses such as RSV, PI3, bacteria like Mannheimia hemolytica, and also lungworm uh, would be also a part of those pathogens, and then environments that they're in. And all of them culminate together to cause these lesions um, that can cause respiratory disease in calves. Um, so I think a lot of farmers and also vets often think of the short-term impact of respiratory disease on productivity. So farmers will think of the cost of getting a, a vet out to investigate, to clinically examine calves, also the cost of treatments, antibiotics, anti-inflammatory use. And if you have debts, you might think of the cost of the knackery to, to collect the dead animals. But really and truly, I think farmers need to focus on the long-term impact or repercussions of respiratory disease on productivity. So there's a stu study shown on, on uh, fattening animals that animals with overt clinical signs, so those with severe clinical cases of respiratory disease, took 59 days longer to finish in one study. And even more interestingly, cattle that were not sick in the same pen with these sick animals, so these are the subclinical cases, they took 33 days longer to finish. So that's a massive uh, additional extra cost feeding those cattle for 33 or 59 days longer with concentrates. And that is going to ultimately affect or negatively affect your profitability at the end of the day. So what can we do about bovine respiratory disease? But I'd love to say that vaccination is the be all and end all to solve this issue. But as I said earlier, it's really and truly part of a multifaceted approach when it comes to controlling disease. So we have to incorporate those biosecurity measures, good hygiene, good management, and in particular, really good housing, good ventilation for calves, avoiding drafts, dry bedding, uh, and all that that's been discussed earlier. But vaccination is a very important component in controlling bovine respiratory disease within your herd. So I often get asked this at events by farmers, well, what vaccine should I consider for my calves for, for respiratory disease or other diseases? And unfortunately, there's no one size fits all here. So this is where I say, it's really important to engage with your own vet and discuss your own case or your own setup with your own vet because your vet will know the history of your farm. They'll know the incidence of disease, they'll know the, the mortality cases you, that you've had. They'll also know diagnostics. So if your vet has done diagnostics in the past, but say for respiratory disease, they may have done nasal swabs or serology, which is blood testing. They'll know the results that came back from the labs and what agents are common on your farm that then you can adapt uh, and implement a vaccination program that's suitable. Also post-mortem results, your vet will be aware of the results there. So I think if, you've, uh, if you want to know, definitely um, discuss it with your own vet and they will guide you uh, in the right direction. But MSD Animal Health have a very broad, comprehensive uh, respiratory product portfolio. Uh, which would include two intranasal vaccines, Bovillus intranasal RSP Live and Bovillus Nation C. Both of these vaccines are the only vaccines currently marketed on the, li on, current, um, on the market that are licensed from the day of birth. Both of these are two mil intranasal dose up one nostril 
and they have a duration of immunity of 12 weeks and they're covering the main viral culprits that we see that cause uh, back or cause pneumonia in young calves so that's RSV, PI3 and bovine coronavirus. We also have a, a, a vaccine that's around for about 20 years Bovillus bovipast RSP and that provides protection against RSV, PI3 but also a bacterium and Hymia hemolytica that's very commonly implicated in pneumonia in stock as well in Ireland. This vaccination is inactivated so it's not a live one like the other two I discussed therefore it requires two doses which is five mils under the skin four weeks apart. And finally, another vaccination to consider for preventing our pneumonia would be Bovillus IBR Mark Alive. And as the name suggests, this provides protection against IBR, which is caused by bovine herpes virus 1. Another vaccine to consider, this is unrelated to pneumonia, will be Trivivex 10 or Trivivex T. And this provides protection to young calves against clostridial diseases, which can cause often nasty diseases that often uh, result in acute or sudden death in young stock in Ireland. So this is a, a nice resource. If you want to kind of build a vaccination calendar that's suited to your own herd, you can go to bovillus.ie and there's a tab there that you can select, click to build your own vaccination calendar. You fill in all your details, uh, your name, address, and what sort of farm you have, what sort of diseases you want to prevent against, and then you'll get your own uh, vaccination calendar sent out to you with the time, which vaccine to give at certain times of the year to your calves. So just to conclude, uh, this is an example of a vaccination protocol for bought in calves. Um, now, this is a very, very comprehensive one. It's the most comprehensive vaccination program you can give against calves, against respiratory disease currently uh, in the country. Now, that's not to say that it's to suit every farm. So some farms might use the top two lines. One farm might use just the bovie pass, the green one on the bottom. But this is just to give you the overall most comprehensive cover. So we recommend um, administering 24 hours after arrival. So you can vaccinate calves on arrival, but we recommend 24 hours after because they've had enough stress and it do you don't want to compound it further by handling them and giving vaccinations intranasally or um, parentally, which would be subcut for above past. So we say 24 hours after arrival, you can consider giving nasogen C to provide protection against bovine respiratory coronavirus and intranasal RSP live to provide protection against RSV and PI3. And then if you want to cover against IBR, you can go in two, about one to two weeks later with an intranasal dose. Once casts are over three months of age, that can be intramuscular. And also you can give Bovipass on the same day as IBR Mark Alive. So it's very convenient to give both on the same day, but one's intranasal and one's under the skin. And don't forget to give the second dose four weeks later for the booster shot for Bovipass RSP. And that's it, Alex. Okay, thanks Sarah, very interesting there. I suppose just a quick one there, you know, there's, there's many products with many companies around and there's um, intranasals and injectables. And the question we often get, uh, you know, at discussion groups, etc., is, you know, which do you go with? You're buying a calf in, he's three weeks of age, and he's landing on your farm, uh, or whatever age he is. Um, do you go with the in in intranasal or do you go with the injectable? Which way is the best way to go, do you think? I think there's no one size fits all here. I think it's case by case. So that's kind of going back to what I said about the vet. You know, no, your no own attending vet, knowing the history, knowing diagnostic results of what's, what's happening on your farm. But if you want a very fast, effective uh, a vaccination program, you can use the two intranasals. They work very, very fast. There's an onset of immunity within a week for RSV, PI3, and actually five days for coronavirus. And they last for, for 12 weeks uh, duration as well. But if you've had an issue with Mannheimia hemolytica or pastorella type of pneumonias, I would recommend the Bovipass to RSP for those. So it's case by case and as I said, it just depends on your history and the prevalence of, of different viruses or agents within your, 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 your herd. Okay. Talk to your vet is what you're saying, I suppose. Yes. Really. Yeah. Okay. Right. Many thanks for that now, Sarah. Now we're going to move on to have, a, I suppose, a, a discussion with all the three panellists here. Um, so keep those questions coming in on, on the chat and we'll, we'll answer them as best we can. Um, so I suppose the first one there from Martin uh, is directed to you there. What's your opinion on whitewashing balls and gates in the cash shed? Is, is it effective in terms of, I suppose, disease prevention after you power wash the sheds or? Yeah, you know what? And, and I remember doing it as a kid a long, long time ago. And we often sneer at these things a little bit. I'm a huge supporter of whitewash. It, right. is, it's, it was interesting. I was talked to a, a particular veterinary consultant abroad and we we're talking about managing scour and so on. And they, we talked about the use of lime on particularly rough wall surfaces because it fills in all the cracks, fills in the areas. It's a very, very high pH and kills quite a lot of bugs. Um, I find it very, very useful and it's a cheap and easy thing to do. One thing about it is mind yourself with it. You can get burnt with that. So when you're when you are mixing up a lime wash, uh, 
mm. gloves, masks, etc. But I like it. Yeah, absolutely, okay. Alan. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another one for you then, I suppose, we'll, we'll keep going, I suppose. Could you expand a bit maybe on the use of the sawdust that says here, we're supposed to mean wood chip, and calf mm. slats uh, as a bedding to cut down on straw use? Um, there's obviously, I'd say, someone maybe in the western half of the country, sure. straw is, yeah. is extremely dear. Look, uh, it's costing up to 50 euros for round bed in place at the minute mm. uh, and hard to get, so. Yeah, look, and again, it's, it's back down to the ages of these calves. As calves get older, they're far more tolerant of, let's say, a less warm bedding. The young calves, again, if we can prioritise them, that under the month of age before they're becoming ruminants. So if I'm using wood chip, I'll get in a good pile of it, put in a couple of feet of it. So you create a very, very absorbent bed that you don't have to go changing out. And then you top up uh, with a, a layer of straw on top of that. So with the level of drainage you're getting or the level of absorption within the wood chip, uh, you will use less straw to get away from that 20 kilos uh, per calf a week. Uh, slats I will use. Now, the problem is with slats, keeping some straw up on them to provide some form of nesting. If they're sitting down on top of the bare slat itself, we're probably going to lose a certain amount. You know, uh, we, we, we are going to have issues there. I think the one thing we've got to consider, and I'm sure it'll be covered in, in the next webinar, is that if we have a cold environment, we have low levels of bedding, ramp up the feed. The more feed that we get in there, if we're getting significant temperature drop, or we get an outbreak of pneumonia, up the feed straight away. And mm -hmm. I'm talking about add a litre into the mix there uh, pretty quickly, and you'll get a response from calves. Okay, and just one question, just come in there in a second. Do you, if you are to go with hay, it might be what's available on farms. Yeah, yeah, and look, and, and a lot of guys in the might have old material hanging yeah. around in barns. It, it, it's better than nothing, but hay, I know from experience with it, yeah, it, gets, it turns into a, a flattened mess mm. and bloody difficult to clean out of it. So I prefer to stay away from it, but if that's what you have, that's what you have. Okay, so moving <coughs> on to you there, Sarah. Um, someone said they have a, a bit of a problem there, I think, with coccidiosis. Dose five times last year. Um, dung samples shown, it says 10 to 40 egg count. Um, going on for a few years, fields are receded, um, but, um, and calves always have access to, to straw outside. Is there any way of helping to build better immunity to coxie while rearing, such as keeping them on milk longer? What's your opinion on that? I mean, it, it's a frustrating uh, history mm. there based on how many times he's dosed throughout the year. Uh, it depends on the product that they're using, number one, for, for treating against coccidiosis. Obviously, there's other ones available on the market other than our MSD Animal Health product. But uh, number one, make sure that it is confirmed that it is coccidiosis, which it sounds like he has done with, the, uh, with his counts that he's done. Often after a treatment, you can't expect a full elimination either of the oocysts. And there, we were uh, speaking actually earlier this evening. The, the cause of the coccidiosis is a little oocyst and it's a very hardy resistant spore that can survive inside and outside, particularly on kind of uh, ground that is dug up or, or wet or damp, I would say troughs or gateways. Um, but if, if he's using a certain product, our product, we recommend certain re treatment regimes and make sure that he is following that. So if he's happening to get it uh, every year at a certain time, we recommend going in two weeks prior to that known period or going in at least one to two weeks before a stressor. So whether that's weaning, castration, moving from a different place to another, that's another option. And then the third option, which I probably wouldn't recommend based on that history, will be to wait for clinical signs. So wait for one or two calves in the batch of the calves to display that horrible bloody right. scour uh, and then going in. And also just, I hope, I'm sure based on that history as well, it's, it's a group disease. It's not just one or two animals. So make sure that you're doing the whole entire group as well with it. Mm -hmm. But it is very frustrating because as I said, it's a very hardy little spore that can survive in, in, in these environments here. Okay, and uh, just a follow slight follow-up question, I think from the same person saying, you know, the, the, these cattle are going out at a shed at 14 months of age now. Are they susceptible again next year? You need to go again with a coccidiosis treatment at that stage or would it be okay? Just Not necessarily. Acid? Typically, the, the, the higher incidence of coccidiosis would be in younger stock. So they, right. when they're exposed at a younger age, the first time they've no immunity. You rarely would see it in, in adult stock, uh, that blood scour. Okay. Um, someone has a problem with ringworm. Maybe, Sarah, have you, have you any products available for that now? I know a lot of people use different methodologies and cold yeah. cures, etc. And some work and some don't. But you can think of holly bushes there. Holly, no. yeah, holly, 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 holly bushes still available. Yeah. Yeah. And it's free. <laughs> um, you can see that lots of sheds. What, a, what are, is there any products available to kind of there, cure There used ringworm? to be a vaccine for ring vac. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's currently not available on the market. There is a non-MSD product that's a, like a wash uh, that has to be used multiple times, different applications, so many days, intervals mm -hmm. in between. 
fine. Um, but it's, 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 it tends to be kind of a seasonal thing, you know, when they go inside as well, Martin, you probably agree with me, ringworm, it tends to be in batch the calves. Um, and it, it's, it's frustrating and it can be obviously cosmetically or aesthetically not very pleasing to look at. Mm -hmm. But uh, the best one on the market would be that kind of application, which is you'd, you'd spray it onto the lesions and you have to repeat it multiple times with, I think, two to three days intervals. It's, it's uh, Okay. That's available. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Moving on to you, Peter, then, I suppose. Uh, one question in. Is there anything you changed? You built a new calf shed oh, what, five years ago, was it, or thereabouts? Uh, and yeah, 2018. 2018. So it, you've had a few years running with it now at this stage. Is there anything you change looking back if you start again? Um, maybe, like Martin was saying, maybe sometimes it could be a little too wide, a little too cold. Mm -hmm. and maybe short, narrowed a little bit, but um, maybe an access door either side. I'm thinking of having like a wood chip area at the side and you can get calves out to relieve a bit of the pressure on the on a shed on a on a warm day or something like that. Um, other than that, I'm pretty happy with the way the, with the, okay. the shed is going. And, and that's quite a that's quite a neat idea, and I see it more and more, particularly with automatic feeder systems that, that we're looking at providing outdoor access, and not just necessarily to relieve uh, infectious pressure inside us. Okay, as calves get bigger, we often we often don't think about the fact that the level of live weight that's in the pen is increasing. So while we have kind of almost set rules of say two square meters for, for, for calf area, when we start off calves and they're adding a kilo a day in, in those instances, the live weight in the pen starts to increase quite dramatically. So I, I always think in terms of that. Um, so when we start off calves and pens, uh, it should look like you should have lots of room to put more in, which is the tendency that we often do. But having that access outside can have a number of effects that also allow a bit of introduction to grass introduction to an outside environment. Uh, so I, I think that would make sense. And probably if I one thing I remember seeing your shed back in 2018, P Peter, it was probably, it was built at the time, or you had a, it was a large shed at that point, and that little bit of a squeeze in. Yeah, sure, yeah. So I suppose it wasn't necessarily built. It wasn't a calf as shed. A, as a calf yeah, shed, yeah, it, was, absolutely. it was a multi-purpose shed. Um, mm. th calves the whole time at the moment, but. Yeah, and fair enough, and I think we have to look at our sheds too as as multi-purpose or as many uses as, as we can. If we follow some principles, we can make them work, you know, so I think that makes sense. Okay, and how many, so another question, how many calves are you putting in each pen, Peter, I suppose? What size are your pens and what do you typically put in? Yeah, so the pens are 20 foot wide and the spans are four foot, or four bays long. So I'm putting around 50, 55 mm -hmm. calves comfortably in it. Okay. And that's comfortable to say weaned weight. Okay, and this is Martin, I suppose you touched on this in your presentation, calf jackets, are they worth the money? How much are they? Yeah, I, I, I don't know how much they are, I'm not deliberately avoiding that one, there's a variety of them there. Um, I, certainly up to that kind of three weeks, month of age, particularly in those larger buildings where we have large airspace, uh, I am quite fond of them. And also we have to look at, with a lot of our dairy bred calves coming in and level of fat cover in those calves, they, they are a different beast. Um, so I am fond of using calf jackets, yes, particularly in those colder environments, yeah. Okay, and Sarah, there's one here for you, I suppose. Um, I suppose going back to this vaccination, I is there, a, I suppose, the stressors on farm coinciding with maybe pneumonia vaccines, are you best to avoid that? Or what's your opinion maybe on vaccinating on the dairy farm before they arrive? That would be ideal if you could get them and, and know the, what vaccine they received and what they're covered against before they arrive because it means then the answer immunity has kicked in well before they've got to you. So before that stressor of getting transported from A to B. Um, I suppose as well if it was if it was Bovi Pass or something like that, you want to make sure that, well, when did they get it so you know then when you're going to go in with that second dose or the booster shot. Um, and if it's intranasal, you might just that that might provide enough protection that you need for the 12 week period that the high risk period when you're when you're buying in your batch of the calves as well. And just before I move to Peter there, how, how, there's another question. How long does it take for these vaccines to work, the intranasal and the, the injectable? How long? Yeah. What's, the, what's the period before so they kick they in? They all differ. Yeah. So for bovillus intranasal RSP live, it kicks in on six days for RSV and six. seven days for PI3. Right. And nasogen C kicks in on five days for coronavirus. And for Bobby Pass RSP, the onset of immunity actually is two weeks after the second shot. So it's really six weeks after okay. the first dose. So if you have an early onset problem, you're probably better than intranasal. Absolutely, then. yeah. Uh, Pete, are you going intranasal or, or injectable or what products, what type of one um, are you using? Injectable, yeah, the, the, mm. the injectable Bobby Pass. Um, um, like I said, working with dairy farmers there now to give the first shot on the host farm. And that'll just, it'll speed up the... Like you said, by the time they get the second, I can give them the second shot nearly a lot quicker on my farm then. 
And if the source farm is vaccinating uh, with bovipast, they need to give that when they're two weeks of age. So they okay. can't go in at the day of birth like the intranasal because there could be interference from the antibodies from the beasts and from the cows. So you have to wait until they're two weeks. Okay. Um, but at least they'd have it started off the yeah. program for you then. Yeah. Right. Okay. Peter, there's a question about how you constructed your canopies for creating the microenvironment. What product did you use or what type of material um, have you got put in there? I just used uh, an insulation board. Mm. Um, I just wanted it for a lightweight material <coughs> for lifting up and down on the pulleys for cleaning it out. It also has a file back. So any heat generated by the calves, it, it doesn't let it out and keeps keeps the area a little bit warmer. Mm -hmm. um, it's just easy to handle and it's it's kind of a warmer material. Right. And but just one practical thing about about the canopies is just make sure they're up high enough. They will eat them. And that's one thing we'll see people put up canopies and they're happy out. And the next thing you know, as the straw rises, they end up getting the they they lose their canopy. So like four f four foot minimum. Yeah. yeah. Martin, what, what's your, while you're talking there, Martin, what's your opinion on a polytunnel as calf housing? People looking at low-cost options, I suppose. Yeah, I, I, look, I've, I, I've seen a few of them. Um, again, if we follow the principles, polytunnels can be very useful, but the fact that we're often really restricted on the level of air that can get in mm. the sides of them. Um, so sometimes they will, they'll have ventilation up top and we can get some air out, but getting air in can be a challenge. Where I've seen them work actually quite well as polytunnels where we do put a positive pressure tube in to pump air into them. So it's quite an artificial environment, but it can work quite well um, when, we, when we haven't got a clear inlet and outlet for the, poly, for, for the polytunnel. Okay, okay. This is for Peter then. How, I suppose uh, just in terms of the whole business of calf rearing, how many calves do you plan to go to? Where's the end game? How many are you doing at the minute? <coughs> and I suppose, where's the plan for the farm? I suppose we're at 180, 200, 180, 190 at the moment. And the plan over the next two years is to probably get to about 250. Okay, and how, how would you split that down? Are you still going to focus on the spring a lot because of availability? Um, I'm going to try and do about 100 in the autumn, and I'm, to be honest with you, I'm trying to kind of steer away from this later calf. Right. Um, that's a lot of the reason for the autumn as well. It's a good few, like between splitting the workload and obviously the spring calves, I, I have the local lads there and I'm kind of happy with the calf I'm getting. It's just to get rid of the later calf more so as well. Okay. And in terms of the autumn one, then there's a few questions in it. What's your plan for them? When will they be killed? I suppose they're, they're how will they fit in with the with what's on happening on the farm already? Mm. Yeah, sure. Hopefully, <coughs> try and have those gone out of the system before the heavy load comes into the for the spring ones to come back into the shed. Mm. Um, it's just it's a way of ha upping the stock numbers without having to really spend on infrastructure. Right. And that's that's the way I'm kind of trying to fit it in at the moment. So when will you kill them? What's your plan? Do just slaughter or when will they go? those calves? Oh sure, I'm hoping they'll go September, <coughs> October. Two year olds? Yeah. Okay. Mm. okay. Um, question then, we'll just stick with you Peter for a second because uh, I've seen him in the, the video, the thermostatically controlled red lamps, um, you had those red lamps hanging off the, in various places along the shed have you? Yeah, it's, it's, um, it is, it's a cold shed mm. at the start. Okay. Um, if I'm taking in 10, 15 calves, the first calves, the shed tends to be fairly cold so I'd have the lamps on hanging down from from my um, canopies and they're on a stat then and once it goes under a certain temperature the lamps come on and likewise with the calf feeder we can go if it goes under a certain temperature we can up the feed okay excellent and are the calves any dearer then there's another question a lot of interest in these autumn calves are they dearer these autumn calves or are they costing them the same as spring or um, money? yeah they're the same to be honest um i actually I thought they were going to be dearer, but no, they're the similar uh, money. Yeah, similar money. Yeah. Right. I'm okay. definitely going to say they're the same anyway, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, I suppose rota question about rotavirus uh, showing up, um, Sarah, after four days after arrival um, at four weeks old. Is 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 there anything? Is it, is it that the, the they're not being vaccinated in the dairy farmers or anything can be done? What's the, is there any preemptive treatment that a, a guy buying these calves up with rotavirus can get? Or yeah. is it rotavirus? Is it? So, so rotavirus it, it typically causes nasty disease when they're mm. about two weeks of age, kind right. of up to two weeks of age. Thereafter, if they're three, four or five weeks of age, it doesn't usually cause a severe disease, just the way that the virus affects the, the lining mm. of the gut. Um, the, from the source farm, if the, the, the pregnant heifers or cows get rotavirus corona, that would pr provide protection against rotavirus scours. But typically when they're that age, there could be another reason why the scour is, is at play there. So just right. maybe get the sample sent off to, the, to your regional veterinary lab or your local lab. Often vets do a sample on site and it tests just for four agents, four very common ones, but there can be other issues as well at that age with calves. 
Um, and often samples will come, come back positive with rotavirus. It's ubiquitous, meaning it can be everywhere. So if you took a sample from a cow today, she could be positive in rotavirus and also a calf, but it may not be the issue that's causing the scour in them. Okay. Um, we're moving back to there, Martin. Colostrum mm. intake. Um, mm. You touched on it earlier, I suppose. Uh, are you more in favour of stomach tubing or leaving the calf suck? Or I suppose it depends maybe on the farm individually, but I suppose is it better to ensure to have it by some means? Rather than yeah, yeah. I mean, I think in fairness, in the in the kind of the maelstrom of what happens in springtime and the busyness and so on, guaranteeing colostrum intake uh, certainly by tube or feeding deliberately feeding the calf. So um, I see th there's no there's no real significant difference be between either in terms of the impact on the calf. I think if we have a good tubing method with clean equipment. Um, you know that you're cleaning and sanitizing the, uh, that equipment and giving the right volumes it works perfectly well would I leave a calf to suck a cow not my modern dairy cow no because her like her maternal instinct is not a, it, she hasn't got that drive to guarantee that suck so on uh, whatever happens I'm going to feed that calf yeah. and look in fairness Irish calves uh, like even when they're from an export point of view Irish calves are preferable going into a lot of calf rearing systems over in Europe because of like they're they're they take on less antibiotics over there. So the the general behaviour, the general behaviour on colostrum and getting colostrum into dairy cows is pretty good. Okay, uh, Sarah, question there. Never vaccinated for IBR. I presume they haven't really had any obvious problems. Should they start? Would you recommend someone to start vaccinating? It's not a deer vaccine, it's supposed to begin with. No. Like, is it? <laughs> Uh, well, it's very prevalent in Ireland, mm. so there's lots of studies done and, and it, it, there's at least 75% of both beef and dairy farms that have the virus circulating. Um, a lot of people don't get neonatal IBR, which is, a, is the form in very young calves, which has a very high mortality. So a lot of deaths associated with really, really sick calves with an awful pant on them. Mm. Um, so if they haven't had a, an instance of that, then by all means, they don't have to go in early. But it might be no harm to consider when they're three months plus, just with the high level of, of the d virus in Ireland unless your herd mm -hmm. is closed. But I take it that this person's buying in calves, are they? Uh, yeah, I would assume, yeah. listening to this assume, tonight. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they'd be coming from possibly multiple sources, so there's more than likely the virus will be present in some of them. Okay, and uh, Peter, back to you there. I suppose someone's asking a more general farmer type question, I suppose, uh, you know, there, we're see hearing of a lot of risk with calves and there's a lot of issues, I suppose, that you, get, you can get, obviously. Um, buying runners, I suppose, or reared calves or something, is that something you've ever considered or looked at or have you done it? Or? Um, yeah, I haven't done, I've, I've bought a few autumn calves reared, um, mm. it's the first time, but in general, no, um, f to be honest, I find it hard to, to get them yeah. locally, um, it just it happened to be working out that I have a couple of local farmers, the calves aren't travelling any more than 10 or 15 minutes, and that's kind of suiting me at the moment. And would you consider that a big help with your, the health space of your farmers, if they're only travelling 10, 15 minutes in a trailer, there's no... Yeah, sure, it's very stress little stress, by the time they're kind of getting into the trailer, they're nearly mm. back out again, and... Mm. Okay. Uh, question, I don't know if you Peter there, I suppose rodents, I haven't heard this question before, but people are having trouble with um, rodents coming in, nipping at the concentrate after a few hours because I suppose it's there 24-7 in, in a trough, I suppose, in front of calves. Any issues with that? No, I don't, no. don't really see it at all. Yeah. And what's your breed preference, I suppose? What breeds you generally, are you going to, you, we see a lot of Frisians obviously in the pictures, I, are you going to stick with it or are you going to change, I suppose, we're going to touch on that again the next day, but what are you doing yourself? Um, yeah, it's mostly Frisian. Mm. I'm not stuck to any particular mm. breed. It's basically it's availability. Frisian is available probably earlier than, like I want to get the shed in and filled as quick as I can, the way I was doing in my spring system because I don't need to get it filled again. So the Frisian was the, mm. the available calf. Um, I'm quite happy with the Frisian. I don't mind bringing in Angus or her for any other breed. It's just that's what's available to me at a good price. And so it's here early in the year, basically. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, question: If a calf dies, is it worth getting sent to the vet lab? Sarah, you, Sarah, what do you think? One hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because even when I was a vet in practice, and I'm sure Martin will agree with me, you can't beat the diagnostic results from a post mortem. Now, occasionally, you can co come back inconclusive or not a definitive diagnosis. But in general, often what can happen is you might have one or two deaths and you don't bring them to lab. And then when there's a third or fourth or fifth death, you regret not sending that animal, regardless of their age, to, to your local lab. And ideally fresh as well, a fresh case, you know, don't leave it. Okay. If it dies on a Friday, maybe on Monday, yeah. it might be too autolyzed for the lab to get results from it. Okay. Simple rule is don't waste a dead calf in one way. Uh, there's a lot of, yeah. and, and your vet coming in can do a very quick v overview of lungs and so on and like there's certain patterns that they can um, y you know vet vets with good interest in that pathology side can 
go a long way towards guiding around that vaccine protocol and so on. So it, uh, look, it's always useful. And is that re the reason you see inconclusive the calves are left too long before you know the so occasionally, yeah. yeah. But generally, I de deal with a lot of post mortem mm. results now. Come back to your case that I deal with, and you you know most are satisfactory. You get an answer, you know, right, right. and often they find multiple different uh, infectious diseases are going on in animals that okay. are sent in. And I suppose a question there, Martin, they're just on, on the building again, maybe Peter, my mm. comment. Calf pins, uh, for calf pins, I said, I mean, uh, mm. gates or solid dividers, I suppose, stock board, and is there, is there any benefit of stock board for young calves? Uh, you know, there is, again, in those, in, in, in w where there's risk of draft and wind chill inside and sheds where doors have been opened and all of that kind of crack going on, certainly stock boarding. I would have stock boarding on pens for younger calves. There's no question I would do that. Um, so as calves, as I say, as they get older, their level of tolerance gets a little bit higher. And a lot of dairy farms, and I, I, we would always work with what we call nursery areas at the beginning. We're up to that two weeks of age. We're really managing calves in as what, what, what I would describe as draft-free environments, so we will use stock board. Okay. I don't think you use it in your shed, do you? I don't no, think you have to, Peter, do you? No, we're kind of running just the two pens, one mm. pen either side. Um, we're kind of getting them in in a, in a short time frame, so they're kind of coming in close together and they're, they're kind of all working off the automatic feeder, so it's, I, I just don't see It's it. a different system. It's not, yeah. not, it's not needed in my shed. And what age, Peter, do you take them out of the pens or when, what age do you wean in them at, generally? Um, so it's mostly about between 10 and 12 weeks of age, mm. um, kind of weaning them anywhere between 96 kilos and 105 kilos. Okay, and I suppose a question came in there, Peter. And you're using automatic feeders, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose do you consider them worth the investment? I suppose there is obviously something there with problem with the vat at the minute that was it could be reclaimed before, which there will be in the future. I don't know, but it made them that maybe a bit more expensive. You, what's your opinion on them? You're using them for a while now, just personal use. Yeah, look, I'm happy with the feeder. It's um, it's 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 it's, it's good management with calves for me. But before I didn't have one, but up in the numbers now, it's just. You know, they, there's no bullying. The calves get exactly the amount. It's mixed. Mm. It's mixed right. Uh, you can mix it right yourself, but it's it's mixed cons consistently right. Temperature is right. You can see, pick up a sick calf quicker, maybe with the drinking speed dropped or, mm. or how many times they break off the teeth, stuff like that. You still obviously have to check the calves, like, but it's just. Yeah. If you can check the feeder first before you go walk around the pen, and you can so look. It's a labour saver for you, really. So yeah, it is yeah. anyway. Um, the question then, I suppose, about your, your I suppose, the business um, you're working at the minute, like, are, are you bulls or bullocks is the question, I suppose. Um, have you ever tried bulls? And I suppose, are you, did you ever send them to the market or is it all factory? Um, never tried bulls. Um, mostly all bullocks and everything goes to the factory at the moment. Um, I just fine with the Frisians. That's the, okay. that's where I'm happiest with. Um, and I suppose uh, another question then, uh, uh, Sarah, I suppose down to you, is it possible to vaccinate early born calves against who's, I suppose, treat them? I suppose how, how quick should you go in with maybe a who's treatment, I suppose, uh, when they go to grass, I presume is what they mean? There is actually a vaccine, so maybe they or maybe they the maybe yeah. got, yeah, so there is a, a vaccine for a lungworm for, it's called HUSFAC. Um, calves have to be eight weeks of age before they, they get it and it's two doses, four weeks apart. So it probably suits your autumn born calves more so because you're going to be delayed. You can't uh, turn them out on pastures until two weeks after the second dose. And it's a bit unusual. It's an oral dose as well. Mm. They, they get two, two doses four weeks apart. Okay. There might be some older members of the audience there <laughs> who remember <laughs> using Diktov back in the day, oh, yeah. a long, long time ago, which is, which is pretty much, yeah, it's the same, s same product. Okay. And Peter, do you, do you source from the same farmers every year or do you change around? I know you don't go that far, but do you... Um, yeah, we're... We're changing at the moment. Last year or two, we haven't. At the start, we have been, but kind of building up a good relationship with with the farmers at the moment. And it's just on getting healthy calves. Um, that's the main thing: is the healthy calf first, okay. and then try and work with them. Then afterwards, and on improving genetics and stuff. Okay, um, Sarah, just two questions for you. There, we're getting near the end now. So just keep any last few questions you have coming in. Um, I suppose black leg, a protocol for black leg vaccination. And I suppose the second one is, someone's asking, would you just treat calves for coccidiosis before, before they go to grass? 
just across yeah, the board. It, it, well, yeah, I'll start with the second question. So yeah. if they're over three weeks of age, you can do that. You can give them all a blanket treatment okay. for coccidiosis. And then for your clostridial uh, from our product portfolio, there's two that will cover against black legs. There's a lot of different clostridial ones, but clostridial mm -hmm. shovi causes uh, black leg in cattle classically in Ireland. And it's Trivex T or Trivex 10. So if you would say if we'll just take the 10 one, it would be quite commonly used in calves. Uh, they need two doses. If they can be two weeks of age. First of all, they have to be before they get it. And it's two doses, four to six weeks apart uh, for covered against black leg. Okay. But just, just one thing, and I think uh, absolutely on the custodial uh, dosing at that three weeks, but just in case when someone's talking about before they go to grass, uh, again, probably our preference is that they're outside for a period of time in case they pick up another species of coccidiosis and they're managed in at the risk time for, for that. So there's, there's two stages to it. We got that young stage of that three weeks point, absolutely mm -hmm. fine inside. But again, if we're looking at coccidiosis at grass, they need to be out a little bit before we do them. So generally they're out 10 days, two weeks before we're looking at doing them. Okay, very good. I suppose Peter, just back to you there, a um, bit on the profitability side of things more in your business, I suppose. Um, are you a favour of the Frisian in terms of the profit? And, and uh, I suppose, are they hard finished? I suppose we always get this thing that you couldn't finish a Frisian out of the shed, but you always manage to do it. And wh wh what kind of carcasses are you getting or grading? Um, yeah, sure. We're killing them any time between 19 months and 25 at the moment, the last year or two. Um, yeah, sure, look, they're grading from O minus, so equals P plus. Mm -hmm. um, mostly 3 minus 3 equals 3 plus grade, the fat covers. Um, Preference, like I said, is, is the availability. Mm -hmm. um, I think they weigh well for the price you're paying for them. Um, weights coming in probably averaging three ten kilos. Yeah. Okay. Um, quite happy with that so far. Okay. I suppose in terms of someone's asking a few questions about profit. I suppose for last year, I know we haven't profit really covered in profit monitors or anything done yet, really. But I suppose twenty three was a tough year. I suppose overall, it was in terms of input costs. I suppose and weather. Well, how did you find it? Yeah, um, sure, same as everyone. Um, animals, live weights are live weights are back on my animals. The live weights are back on the other back. I know from thirty to forty kilos. Yeah. Um, inputs, sure. We can't really, we can't really change that too much. Um, just have to get on with it. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, and I suppose then calves on arrival. Do you use transition milk or electro any electrolytes given at uh, on arrival? I don't use electrolytes because they're not come. They're, they're not. To be honest, they're not travelling far. Um, right. Ten or fifteen minutes in the trailer. Um, I slowly then bring them on to. They start on a program and they start on lower liters and they're built up over two to three days. Okay, very good, very good. Martin, what's the optimum temperature? You probably covered this in the presentation. Someone asked, what's the optimum temperature for calf rearing? Yeah, okay, so, uh, right, the, the book is telling us up to about that two, three weeks of age, a calf at 15 to 25 degrees is, is perfect. Generally, the, the, if they're nesting in straw, straw over their hocks and their knees, and the, when they're lying down, a calf will be at around 15 degrees. I'm not talking about cooking calves inside the house, and you need to be careful that we're not trying to continuously add heat to those young calves. When you're going up to about a month old plus, uh, their tolerance is, you know, you're getting down to that 5, 5 to 15 degrees optimum. Yeah. So as the calf get, it gets older, it gets a lot more tolerant. But wind chill can really, really uh, affect that. So they get, even though the temperature in the house could be okay, they get high wind chill. It actually can, can depress their immune system as such. Okay. And someone asked about, you touched on it already, but these tubes or tunnels, right? Yeah. How much are they to buy, roughly, and are they, are they useful, or where, w where would you not use them, I suppose? Yeah, I suppose I actually saw a shed only there, there last week. I just uh, I popped in to have a look, and again, it, w it was a very, it was a shed with very poor pitch. It wasn't built as a calf shed. Again, they were using kind of a, a very, very large airspace and having constant trouble, and having constant trouble with uh, draft on the windward side. So... Mm -hmm. We looked at closing that down completely, and a tube and fan system was designed for it. They're not; a, they're they're less expensive than you think. You're not getting into the tens of thousands. You're getting into a, you know a couple of thousand, depending on the depending on the nature of the shed. So, um, it, it, for their for what they can achieve in a shed that you're finding difficult to manage, they can be very useful. Are they for every shed? shed? Absolutely not. No, absolutely not. But in circumstances where you cannot control um, that wind coming in, or you cannot control uh, the temperature in that shed, it can be very useful. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, and Sarah there, one of the last questions there to you. I suppose I, you, this guy used an intranasal um, from day one uh, for pneumonia, I presume. It doesn't specify what. But uh, Kaz began to show signs of, I suppose, symptomatic of pneumonia within eight to ten hours. Is this common or is that something maybe that should be investigated? They can get a nasal discharge uh, right. within a short period of time afterwards. That'd be the most common uh, side effect of it. But as long as they're not getting, you know, the severe symptoms that I outlined in the in my mm. uh, presentation, you know, like that rapid breathing, pant on them, a draw, uh, fever, and that they're not off form or, or, you know, reduced appetite. If there's any of those things, get their, your, your vet in because there mm. could be another agent there at play. Okay, a uh, question there, and maybe we'll just have one more question after this. Um, I put it to um, Martin and Sarah, I suppose crypto is probably mm. the biggest, one of the biggest problems I see on farms is, is can be crypto. Mm. I, is it possible, I suppose, to get it out of a shed that had it up for a few years? I suppose there, there is, maybe say you want to touch, there's a vaccine being mooted to come, is there? Yeah, it's time? coming this year, so we're delighted to, to launch. It's actually 23 years in the making, this in research and development. Well, you need and it. Yeah, <laughs> and, and we're actually ahead of human health. They haven't managed to, to, to create a vaccination, which it's a big problem in, in infants in developing parts of the world. Right. But uh, it's a very frustrating scouring calves. It's like when I was in practice, like you could be going to farms, dripping, ca umpteen calves in one visit with crypto. Very, very frustrating because it's a little hardy little spore, it's a protozoa. It's difficult to clear in the shed, um, but in relation to the vaccination that's coming, it's very like Rotavec Corona. So you give it to pregnant heifers or cows pre calfing and then the calves rely on the, the immunity coming from the beastins, from the feed, from, from those vaccinated dams. Right. But in, in relation then to clearing it from a shed, if it's in sheds, I mean, there's obviously you have to use, you have to use a disinfectants that are effective against it. Not all of the disinfectants kill crypto and you want to make sure that you're actually cleaning all that dry feces in the pens, power washing or steam uh, cleaning the sheds. Uh, and then when you go in your disinfectant, you want to make sure they have adequate contact time, which is typically around two hours. So I think a lot of people don't realize that. Mm -hmm. And then to rinse it off. And in the ideal situation, then it needs to be air dried for two, three to four months actually. Um, okay. But it's, yeah, so it's, hopefully the vaccination will help in those herds that have it year in, year out. And it's, Difficult to clear. Okay. Martin, have anything to add on that, your experience over the years? Probably yeah, I dealt with a lot of sort of major outbreaks and often mm -hmm. what we found that farms that had consistent crypto problems, we really had to look at the whole rearing system from kind of day one and certainly that how that nursery period was managed because often we get these outbreaks, as Sarah, is that kind of week 10 days of age, uh, you know, when you get these acute outbreaks and it's so highly contagious. And again, it's even our own behavior, the fact we, we all wear leggings uh, when we go into a pen of calves, uh, calves dung on top of your leggings, you walk into the next pen, the next calf suck it, and you know, so you're constantly, it's highly, highly, highly contagious. So from that point of view, you have to really look how you can break the infectious cycles with crypto in your calf system. And some people can't do it, and they've got to manage it with various drugs and so on. And I think a vaccine will help us no end, there's no question. But actually, we've successfully managed crypto out of farms by really breaking down the system and getting to work for us in terms of reducing the infectious pressure, yeah. And just okay. another comment actually as well, I think a lot of people might be aware it's zoonotic, meaning that we can get it you ourselves. It yeah, so right. if you're on farms and you're handling and treating these scour and crypto cases, you can actually potentially get a nasty dose yourself. Mm. Um, so just be conscious of that. Sure, be very conscious of it. Look, thanks very much. Um, I think we had a great chat here and I want to say thanks to our panel tonight. So that's Martin, Peter and Sarah. And as I mentioned at the start of this, uh, this is the first in a, in a series of our webinars. So the final webinar will be on Tuesday the 30th of January, that's this day two weeks at 8pm, where our panel will be discussing sourcing and feedings of calves. So we've seen a few of those questions come in tonight that will be answered in two weeks' time. Uh, on the night, we're also going to be showing a video we did of where we visited a mart to show how the CBV or the commercial beef value, which is a new technology, has been implemented uh, on, on calf to beef farms and on dairy farms, obviously and we'll bring you to the to show you what I can do for you as a potential calf purchaser. Uh, I'd like to thank my own Dairy Beef 500 team who are in the background helping and our production team here as well in the studio and also to our program sponsors who are sponsoring the Dairy Beef 500 program. So we have MSD, Volac, Munster Bovine, Corteva, Liffey Mills and Drummonds and finally I'd like to thank you as our audience for your questions and, and excellent participation tonight. So finally, just to, I suppose, make sure again, join us around the 30th of January. That's this night, two weeks, again, live uh, at 8 p.m. Thank you. Thanks,